Hello, it's me, Gleb Alexandrov, and in this 30-minute video we'll be dealing with the high-key lighting, the lighting style characterized by really soft shadows, brightly lit frame, an upbeat mood, and low contrast. It is a gorgeous lighting style for product shots specifically, and for this one we're gonna be demoing it using this amazing free cryopod 3D asset by Anton aka Spots Kitchen. I'll leave the link to the model in the description below if you want to check it out. And now I give you the tutorial for high key lighting in Blender's EV. First of all, what is high key lighting once again? I bet you've heard something about the low-key and high-key lighting styles, and basically the low-key lighting is that type of lighting that accentuates darkness, shadows and contrasts. On the other end of the lighting spectrum we have the high-key lighting, that is a complete opposite. The abundance of the brighter tones, the softer shadows and a lower contrast. It often suggests an upbeat mood, but not necessarily. The most important thing about it is that it is really bright and has a very low contrast. In theory, uh, that makes it a good fit for the product shots, commercials, that kind of stuff. Anyway, let's move on to the breakdown of the high-key lighting setup for this capsule that I created in advance. So for the next 30 minutes I'll be walking you through all the light layers and uh, EV settings used for this high-key lighting setup, and I think we can start now. The original cryopod model included a bunch of lights and emissive materials, uh, so I thought we could start from here. This is not how I usually start working on lighting, but it will be okay. So here we are in the Eevee's rendered mode. We can see a bunch of very nice practicals indeed. Because we are rendering it using uh, the Eevee render engine in Blender, we don't see any actual light projected by these light sources. Enabling the screen space reflections in the EV settings helps a bit with at least seeing the reflections projected by these light sources, and while we are on this page, we can also enable the bloom effect to see a little bit of glow around the bright sources, just for the sake of the extra eye candy, I guess, but also to gauge how bright are the actual sources. So these are our practicals that will create the points of extra interest once uh, all the other lights are set up, Next I'm going to activate the collection uh, containing the light sources representing the actual light emitted by these practicals. These are the smaller area lights placed nearby the emissive materials and kind of uh, motivated by them. The point of these lights uh, is to extend the concept of the practicals uh, to give them the actual illumination. It may seem like these lights are pretty hard and pretty bright, but once we add the rest of the setup their light will get dissolved and will serve as a seasoning. The important thing about the EV's lights uh, that we cannot control in cycles is the custom distance. It means that we can actually control the falloff or the distribution of any light source. If we wanted, for example, we could keep these lights away from touching the floor. But I didn't go as far, uh, I just added a little bit of the light falloff. And activated the contact shadows, obviously. The goal of the contact shadows is to capture the shadow detail that the shadow maps just fail to capture. So it is pretty much a no-brainer. We need the contact shadows to be activated for all light sources at all times. Like, look at these details here. They should definitely be in shadow. Now they are. All thanks to the contact shadows. Alright, gonna switch off this light layer and move on to the second one, representing the light coming in from the lamps located within the capsule. I will hide this door by pressing H for a moment, so we can better see the area light here. Nothing fancy, just an elongated rectangle of the area light, a fairly powerful light source at 200 watts. The custom distance is set to approximately 3 meters now. Basically, I didn't want this light to spill onto the floor, how it should probably gone if it was, let's say, the physically correct ray tracing engine. In the physically plausible light transport, the light shouldn't fade over distance like that. But in EV, we can use it to our advantage. So here it just touches the lower part of the capsule and that's it. So this is how the practicals plus two light layers supplementing the light from these practicals look together. Again, the contact shadows are on, just something to remember. 
Again, it may look deceptively bright at that point and deceptively harsh in terms of uh, lighting qualities, but that's not something to worry about. In just a moment we will blast it with a soft environment light coming in from the HDRI panorama and it will fade away, it will blend in really nicely and it will work as the tiny points of interest scattered around. And just some extra exposure. The important thing to understand about the high key lighting is the key fill ratio, or in other words the contrast ratio. So let me dim down the practicals for a second to show what I mean. Pretty much every lighting setup has some kind of a key light, the light that creates most of the illumination and provides some general direction. And then there is some kind of a fill light, usually on the opposite side of the scene, to fill in the shadows generated by the dominant or the key light. And in your average scene, more often than not, the key light is much stronger than your fill light. 5 times, 10 times, or let's say 7 times stronger. This is called the key fill ratio, or the contrast ratio. And for the lower key lighting styles, it usually is pretty drastic. But when it comes to the high key lighting setups, the whole point is to crank up the fill so much to lower the overall contrast and to drop down this key fill ratio to something like 2 to 1. That doesn't mean that there is no directionality, the key light is still stronger than the fill, but the entire image is now way lighter and brighter and we work from that base. What is the perfect way of boosting the fill light if not HDRI environment? Starting with an HDRI panorama is a no-brainer. For the HDRI panoramas I usually go straight to Polyhaven, aka the best place ever to find the public domain HDRI panoramas. So I was looking for some uh, HDRI environment that had lots of bigger, softer, brighter surfaces within it, preferably with some windows, and that brown photo studio HDRI just ticked all the boxes, I think. I used the 4K EXR version of this file, and after downloading it, I imported it straight to Krita, the free and open source image editing software. Essentially, I was going to blur this high dynamic range image a little bit to create a silky smooth, almost out of focus light field that would offer a smooth ambient lighting in Blender, so I went for the Gaussian blur and cranked it up considerably. To something, I believe it was something like 110 pixels. At the same time, it, it offers a free out of focus effect, so what is not to like? Finally, it needed to be exported out of Krita as an EXR file that is important. And once the HDRI was blurred, exported back and ready to go, it was time to load this HDRI into Blender as a crucial high key lighting element, pushing enormous amount of soft light from all directions into our cryopod or any kind of product really. To load the studio HDRI we need the shader editor opened. There we have the good old background light that can be used for the same purpose, but it is just a flat fill, and as such it is quite unimpressive, although the idea is the same, to fill the whole 3D scene with light, with exposure. I'll press Ctrl T to add the environment texture nodes, uh, you need the node wrangler add-on for it to work. So Ctrl T, now we should have all the nodes needed. Now I'm gonna click open and locate the blurred HDRI that we have exported out from Krita. Here it is, I'm gonna double click on it. Jumping in the viewport I'll look around with the shift plus accent grave shortcut uh, to gauge the HDRI and yeah that's a ton better lighting than a gray fill for sure. You can see there's a seam right here that was created on blurring the image in Krita. We can just ignore it for now. Okay, so this is our HDRI environment, wrapping its light around everything in the scene. I think it looks great. The Z rotation within the mapping node serves to pan or scroll the HDRI horizontally. Uh, we can use it to try to find the best looking background and the most appealing lighting for that matter. What I'm trying to do is avoid the complete blend in of the glass and the backdrop. Not all directions are the same, obviously, not all lighting directions, I mean, some are more three-dimensional due to the way the reflections are wrapping around the capsule. For me, uh, that process of finding the sweet spot is a fairly intuitive process, 
Really, I'm just eyeballing it. And here I ended up rotating the HDRI almost by 360 degrees. So almost how it looked right off the bat. Just rotated it by 10 degrees or something like that. And then we have the background strength slider to blow it out into overexposure situation right away, which is a legit kind of normal approach when it comes to high key lighting. This style tolerates some overexposure if done right. But I'll stick with a safe, not over the top intensity for now. A pretty hot, but not completely blown out picture, if that makes sense. Now I'd like to show what I think is a cool trick when it comes to HDRI lighting. What I'll do is set up two background nodes uh, combined in a mix shader. So Shift D to duplicate. I'm gonna plug our studio environment into the second one as well and connect it over here. Now these nodes are the same, obviously. The next thing I'll do is drop in the light path node. And now we need to perform the is diffuse rate check. Uh, to plug it into the mix factor of the mix shader. Control H to collapse the node, to neaten it up, and we are good. Now we have two backgrounds. The first one is gonna be for the glossy rays, so I'm gonna call it BG, meaning background glossy. And the second one will be used for the uh, diffuse rays. Now watch this. By adjusting the diffuse strength, we can control that part of the look, the albedo, or the color of all materials. We can reduce the diffuse reflections or boost them. We can control that aspect of the rendering now. And respectively, the glossy strength will control the specular reflections. Oh, and actually not only the reflections, but also the backdrop opacity, let's say. So I'd better reflect it in the name. So I'm gonna call it, uh, I don't know, something like glossy and all. That's more appropriate. Well, with this cool little trick, we can go ahead and boost the overall reflectivity offered by this HDRI environment to really like emphasize the reflections and metallic components. I will keep it fairly sub subtle though, I think. Maybe uh, something like 1.5 for reflections, how about that? And I don't know, something like 1.2 for diffuse. So not a big difference. Just a little boost to reflections. That already looks fairly good. Feels like base tones were, were lifted enough with the help of the ambient light from that HDRI to look flooded with soft light and create a sense of cleanliness, I guess kind of a sterile lab ambience with a minimal and, I guess, ethereal quality about it. Alright, even though every HDRI is not a uniform light surface and it has a few brighter spots that are more directional, pushing the light from the camera side would make it too flat. The frontal directions tend to be flatter than the side and the back directions, let's say. That usually makes sense. So I'm keeping it mostly at the back and slightly off to the side. To extend that kicker light to the side even further, I added one more ellipse-shaped area light to freshen it up and to soften the speck of reflection in the paint. That doesn't make much of a difference compared to the square lights, but sometimes, especially when the object is a mirror-like surface or something, it does make a difference. Okay, and lastly, to finish off the key light part of the setup, I added one more kicker, this time highlighting the right edge and shoving the reflection from that direction. Reflection, direction, good grief, I'm talking in rhymes already. Anyway, the key takeaway point is that the high key lighting doesn't have to lack direction. The contrast is low, that's true. And still there is the key light and it is stronger than the ambient level. Okay, maybe just two times stronger, you know? But anyway, it still needs that key light to look three-dimensional. One of the tropes of high key lighting is that it possesses a softer quality, and that's often true. That's why I kept all the light sources really big to create softer reflections, not the tiny specular highlights if it were smaller. You see this small type of glint? 
not exactly what we were going for. We need the large light surfaces to show in the reflections, because that just looks great. As for the power in watts, these kicker lights can be really powerful, even obscenely powerful if needed, as this style of lighting really tolerates it. But personally, I don't like it this way here. 20k is already quite powerful. Okay, and to create some separation, I also made these lights slightly cooler than the background lighting. Not really saturated and neon-like, but a barely perceivable tint to keep the hues fairly close to neutral white to give it a creamy and so subtle appearance. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that I trimmed down the diffuse influence for all these lights. I thought it would help with controlling the spill, because I was mostly interested in just the reflections. Honestly, it probably didn't make much of a difference. But here, here is the comparison, just in case. Nothing too fancy, you see. That being said, changing the reflection value does make a difference. That concludes the key light part of the setup. To sum it up, even though the HDRI created most of the look for this style, the proper key lights still take it up a notch by giving it more of a directional quality and popping it out from the background. This is really what it is all about. The name of the game is the light flood to keep the base level high, and then the key light to give it direction, even though it won't have a dramatic influence. Keeping the focus pretty shallow complements the creamy look, so activating depth of field is an easy win. It can be located within the camera settings. As a quick reminder, Numpad Zero teleports you to the camera view. That's one hell of a useful shortcut for Blender. And by the way, if you want to have the higher quality depth of field, its settings can be found within the render settings. And these two checkboxes ticked just make it look way better. I'll keep it off for the time being, though. Another thing worth mentioning is that in EV, edge GRIs don't really cast shadows, so enabling ambient occlusion uh, to add a bit of shading underneath the objects and in the crevices is simply must-have. The ambient occlusion distance can be set uh, higher than that. Actually, if you want to go for that deep self-occlusion look, you can take it really high, to like 10 meters and above. And it can look quite convincing this way, uh, but personally I kept it to a minimum, to just emphasize the, the places where surfaces meet, the crevices and so on. The factor can be changed to a value higher than 1, by the way, to really bring in uh, the darkening, if you wish so, but as I've said, I went for a slightly more subtle pop in the details. That's it for the ambient occlusion. Here's a quick comparison. As you can see, the AO effect becomes quite important when it's almost the only source of shadows, or how should I put it, the only source of self-occlusion. With this effect turned on, it is just more realistic. As we remember for sure, especially if you watched any videos from our cinematic lighting course, everything is better with haze. Haze and fog adds dimension and cinematic depth to any kind of scene, so here I complemented this shot with a bit of hazing using the volume shader contained in this box. We can press Shift F5 to enter the shader editor to see the settings, and here it is. It's the principled volume with a fairly low density. It can be much thicker than that if needed, of course. Okay, the anisotropy controls the way the light is scattered. The higher anisotropy clumps the fog around the light sources and almost looks like a glow, especially if we set it really, really high, pretty close to 1, something like that. As an alternative, I have created the second volume effect, which I moved up to affect only the top portion of this capsule, like the very, very top of the pod, for a mild condensation effect. This is a subtle, almost invisible haze, that is still there. You see an almost imperceivable hazing happening at the top portion of the mesh. To supplement this effect as if there is a thick layer of mist or gas inside the capsule, 
I used yet another volume shader within a cylinder, uh, which follows the shape of that capsule, like perfectly sits inside. If we look at the material, it's the volume shader uh, with a bluish tint and a noise texture used to control the density this time. The color ramp defining the density breakup, so there is a cloudy pattern of fog going on. So among the volumetric effects, there is this layer as well, which I experimented with. After setting up and nailing the base of the look with the HDRI and the key lights, now we are in the realm of special effects, and we are just trying to add nuance to our lighting setup. Like, uh, to double down on this effect, I utilized yet another approach to create fog and mist, namely by using a semi-transparent 2D texture with an animated steam sequence. One of the Ian Hubert's textures kindly shared, thanks Ian. Here's how it was set up. I took the narrow underscore column underscore steam movie file, uh, which is set to cyclic and auto refresh to set it in motion, and that it was fed into the alpha, or transparency of the self-illuminated material for the swirling clouds effect, which will be more visible in the Eevee's material preview, I think, which I will show in just a moment. So basically it looks not necessarily three-dimensional, but it looks like something is swirling inside it, which is pretty fun on its own, and complements uh, the rest of the volumetric effects. So, as I've said, in the material preview it's much more visible. After adding this effect, I couldn't help but also throw in some moths, also the Ian style, into the mix as if there are tiny insects or, I don't know, some particles swirling around the tank as well. Luckily, AD created this effect with the help of the geometry node, and we will share this preset later on, I promise, once we tweak it and clean it up a bit. As I've said, it is a geometry node system, which makes it super tweakable. It is a fully procedural effect, all the properties are exposed, uh, so we can change the size, the color, whatever else, the hue variation, the softness. Look at that! <laughs> that looks nice! Yeah, we can change the general properties of the movement to speed the moths up, and to add some roughness and chaotic brownian motion. It is a lot of fun, I tell you. Consider it as an off-topic mention for now. It isn't the part of the high-key look, really. Just a fun aside, I guess. Oh, there is a biological material inside it. It is a guilty pleasure, you know. Gleb, you need to get back on track. Where is my cup? Getting back on track, I want to double down on the key light direction once more, before wrapping it up. No matter the camera angle, the key lights shouldn't be frontal, usually. Not always, but often. If you draw the line of action like that, the key lights should always be on the opposite side, to maintain the 3D look, say, to catch the beautiful reflections of these area lights. Like, no matter where you place the close-up cameras, as long as they are on the opposite side, you're all set, and the shot will look great. There will be nice and soft reflections gently wrapping around the objects. You just cannot go wrong with it once you draw that line and don't cross it. That is really important. Here I switched over to the second camera, and it still looks good. The setup still holds up, due to the placement of the key lights, among other things. The third camera, the same thing. It shoots into shadows, it stands on the opposite side in relationship to the key lights. That is pretty much all that matters. Well, maybe it's not as crucial with the high key lighting style, because we floated it with the HDRI light anyway, but it is something that I constantly try to keep in mind anyway. Aside from the light flood from the HDRI and all other sources, the huge part of the high-key look involves the exposure and the color management choices. Let me jump back into the rendered mode and find... Uh, okay, as a quick aside, I didn't use the baked indirect lighting, as it makes very little difference with this kind of setup, and the shadows are set to soft shadows. 
these are the things I forgot to mention. All right, so one of the creative choices when it comes to high key lighting is how, how bright do you want the whole thing to be? This style tends to be bright, even overexposed at times, so it makes sense to be mindful about the view transform, like avoid the standard view transform in Blender, as it simply cannot handle overexposure gracefully. When given the overexposed picture, it slams it into the wall of clipping, and things get ugly really quickly. The answer to that is to stick to filmic view transform. It helps that it's set to filmic by default. The filmic view transform is quite resilient to exp overexposure, like a real film. It doesn't look like garbage when presented with such content. It is your choice how bright uh, do you want it to be, how bright do you want to make it. It's very possible to overexpose the film to make it, well, truly high key. But I'll keep it subtle, just a stop brighter or something, like 0.3 in exposure. As for the contrast, I'm not a huge fan of crunching the contrast. I usually uh, keep it within a safer range by going medium contrast instead of, well, higher tiers of contrast. In addition to the exposure slider and the view transform, there are the RGB curves built in. This tool is very sensitive, so should be used in moderation, but it is possible to adjust the contrast and the individual channels from there, like to draw a curve in the greens to colorize the result in some peculiar way, imitating color grading. This is pretty much it. We mentioned exposure and overexposure. The filmic view transform to display the really bright lighting gracefully without ruining these almost clipped values. What else can we do now? The only thing left, if we want to go this road, is some post-processing. So let's explore it really quickly. We are getting dangerously close to sliding off topic with this X-ray info. Yet one more thing I want to cover really quickly is, uh, do we need any post-processing done in Blender Compositor for this kind of lighting style? It is totally up to you. Actually, we have covered the universal post-processing chain in the lighting course we have just released. The only thing that I think would spice it up is actually some chromatic aberration, aka lens distortion. So I'm rendering it out with F12. Um, and you can see I already have created the lens distortion node. Now I'm just cranking up the dispersion value. What it does is create a colorful fringing effect near the high contrast edges, which would make sense in cinematography, for example, if we filmed this set with a wide open aperture, which, especially in the case of cheaper or vintage lenses, tend to produce a sometimes annoying but still beautiful optical aberration. You know this effect for sure. You may like it or not. Personally, I like it. I think it makes sense here, as it emphasizes a really bright backlight hitting the lens and splitting up like this. As a finishing touch, I usually play with the color balance node. So let's drop it here. It has to be set to offset power slope, because the lift gamma gain mode is somewhat broken. So let's see if I can make it any better by first adjusting the mid tones and highlights grayscale vertical sliders, and then possibly nudging the color wheels themselves, like the highlights color wheel to give some tints to the highlights and the mid-tones color wheel as well. The middle and the right uh, ranges, again representing the mid-tones and the highlights. We won't be stopping here though. It is a very subjective thing and I'm leaving it up to you to walk this last mile or not. I think it may look fairly interesting, I'll skip it for now though. It looks smooth as it is. I like the overall simplicity and, how should I put it, clinical purity and an upbeat vibe of the high key lighting schemes, a nice departure from the more dramatic look we were going in for the course. I think it'll look great for all kinds of product shots, really. So thank you so much for watching! Thank you so much for watching this tutorial to the end. If you want to download this crap out asset, 
I'm leaving the link to Gumroad in the description below. Also, feel free to support the artist because you can name your own price, one, two, five dollars, a cup of coffee basically, but only if you feel comfortable about it. Otherwise, it is available for free, obviously. And of course, if you haven't watched our cinematic lighting course, I recommend you checking it out. It is a premium series of blender lighting tutorials for both cycles and EV, dealing with the object or still life shots, with character lighting, with environment lighting. It is one of the most comprehensive lighting courses at the moment, for Blender at least, and I really recommend you to check it out if you want to level up your lighting skills in Blender. Look at my gloves, my gloves are amazing, give it, no, thank you.